So I'm going to go through Seamus Heaney's blackberry picking. The best thing to do with these screencasts is to um, pause the screen on the text when you see lots of explanation like this and make whatever notes that you're planning on making from the text itself then listen to the explanation and add to whatever you write down in that initial um, note-taking action. So blackberry picking is quite simple in terms of its plot structure and the events that make up the poem. It, it describes the event of picking wild blackberries on the farm and surrounding countryside in Northern Ireland as a child in Heaney's life. It describes excitement and the sensual pleasure associated with the event, which is a real um, central component of, of the metaphorical signification of the poem. Because it shifts into the sense of disappointment at the transitory nature of the fruit and the transience of pleasure itself. So the poem becomes, first of all, about the intensity of the pleasure, but then in its transition becomes a poem about the transience of that intensity, the short-lived nature and ephemerality of pleasure. It's been seen in lots of different ways by critics in um, allegorical and figurative ways. The first is as an extended metaphor for Heaney's own disillusionment with his own family's agricultural lifestyle, but then also of a sense of guilt connected with that um, feeling of disillusionment. You know, feeling frustrated by that lifestyle, but then feeling guilty at the sense of frustration that is experienced is a real complex knot of emotional problems, much like the imagery of the, the knot of um, fruit itself in the poem. It's also been seen allegorically as a representation of the transience of pleasure of various kinds. Um, but within that sense of pleasure is the, the loss of the transitory pleasure of childhood innocence. You know, It's another one of those poems that m captures the coming of age experience um, that is common to the poems in Death of a Naturalist, like um, even Digging, but Death of a Naturalist itself, Midterm Break. Here, this is a realisation into the transitory nature of pleasure, where you've got a realisation into the nature of mortality and a realisation of, of developing sexual consciousness in um, Death of a Naturalist. This, in some ways, about the awareness of the temporary nature of pleasure and of positive things in general, which is another component of that adult consciousness, the, the death of the innocent naturalist at the title of the collection. It's also been seen as a sexual coming of age narrative and similar to um, death of a naturalist itself, you know, the heightened awareness of that transitory pleasure and the, the sense of sensuality that the description of the blackberry picking is associated with it's been seen as some form of initiation into the, the, the carnal pleasures of the body and sexuality. Michael Parker's seen the poem as this, a representation of a fall from innocence into experience. It's about a child's unhappy law, recognition of the laws of mutability. This is a sort of fallen poem, you know, a poem about the transition from innocence to experience, almost in the tradition of William Blake and his um, extraordinarily influential collection of poems from the Romantic era. The child's unhappy recognition of the laws of mutability, I think, is the most obvious critical interpretation of this text that you will be most, if you'll excuse the pun, fruitful. The poem begins with a season, a moment of transition. So the opening chronological component of the setting gives us this moment of seasonal transition which fits with this extended metaphor of a rite of passage or a life phase transition that the experience that we're about to see is one of metamorphosis and change as we've seen in many of the other poems in Death of a Naturalist. It's late August, that moment between the juncture that at the, of the juncture between summer and autumn where the weather conditions seem to mirror the mixture of emotional extremes that accompany those transitions in life, it's heavy rain and sun. You know, we've got both extremes, you know, almost of those 
intense emotional um, oscillations that are so, that we associate with transitional stages in life, particularly of the movement from childhood into adolescence and adulthood. So it's given heavy rain and sun for a full week, the, black, the blackberries would ripen. There's a tone of absolute certainty here in this opening couplet that establishes this as a matter of familiarity, of certainty, of concrete reliability, and also one of the natural cycles and repetition. But it's this sense of certainty and kind of concrete reliability that the experience is about to undermine and change, transform. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot, among others, red, green, hard as a knot. So the first uh, interesting metaphor in this description of the blackberries themselves, that initial process of ripening, is of the, the berry as a glossy purple clot, which compares the berries themselves to a blood clot, which is the first of many of these images in figurative language, constructions that establish a tension, a tension between sensuality and violence. And that, that pattern of, of verbal structures connected to violence is associated with the violence that's being done to innocence by this experience that this poem narrates and connects to the theme of change or disruption or transience. So that clot that reminds us of blood, I think, is the first instance of that pattern of metaphorical signification that connects to the violence that's being done to innocence itself by this experience. It's among others, this glossy purple clot, red, green, hard as a knot. So at this moment, obviously, the fruit is unripe. It's, it's unyielding. And that full rhyme in that couplet establishes the contrast, I think, between the ripe yielding berries, those glossy purple ones, and their opposites, those unyielding, um, bound tight fruit that won't give up its sensual pleasures. And that simile there, I think, caps captures that tension between sensual pleasure and its antithesis, that you have this glossy purple clot of fruit that are among others that are bound up as hard as a knot, that are tightly bound and unyielding. As if in some way they're aware of sort of negative connotations of this yielding, ripening that is going to be carried out with the seasons, that they're trying hard to almost keep themselves bound up. You ate that first one and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it. So again... There's a pun here on the word flesh that establishes a link between the flesh of the fruit but also the flesh of the human body and its association with sensuality and sexual pleasure. So there's a link between the fruit itself and that connotation of physical carnality and sexuality, which again suggests that this, this fruit picking is, is not you know, one-dimensional, it's allegorical and metaphorical in its significance and that this eating of the fruit perhaps prematurely is a violation of nature we're kind of getting at pleasure maybe before we should and it's like thickened wine so it compares the fruit itself and the flavor of the fruit to an act of intensified indulgence that's quite sophisticated you know it's thickened wine it's not just ordinary wine it's wine that's been intensively prepared for the act of, of sensual delectation and it gives us the impression of the extreme pleasure that the, the child blackberry picker locates in this act. And then this description of summer's blood being in it. Again, so we've got a clot and flesh and blood all in this opening six lines of the poem that, again, suggests that physical carnality that is associated with the experience of pleasure. The metaphor of, of the fruit juice being like summer's blood gives us the sense that the fruit is the distilled essence of the season itself. It's the blood of the summer. And that actually this, the season is on the brink of death, you know, right at the end of it. And so the fruit almost seems kind of vampirical. You know, it's, it's 
sucked the life out of summer. And that that in some ways seems like a violation of the natural order. And that the person eating it is in some way extracting the essence of a season that is about to die. Of a season in their life that is about to die perhaps. A season of innocence and, and naivety. Someone's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. So again, we've got staining, lust. All of these verbal choices associated with physical pleasure. And so there's a metaphor in the stains upon the tongue, I think, for the permanent change in the speaker's state of being that this experience is going to create. That it's going to stain the individual that undergoes this experience of pleasure and is going to affect all their later understandings of this. The lust for hung, for picking and jambe into that next line, I think, channels all of the energy of that desire. Even from the previous couplet, summer's blood was in it, all the way from here. You ate that first one and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. That all of that dynamism and energy of those enjambed lines are channeled into that single activity and the power of, of being able to absorb all of this sensual pleasure from that one activity. The red ones, then red ones, inked up. So again, the, this verb here, about obviously connecting the ripening fruit to the saturation with ink again carries that connotation of taint particularly echoing I think Blake's poems about experience where there is a staining associated with, with written ink that is about the loss of innocence and then red ones inked up and that hunger and lust that end both of these lines here give the impression i think of the deep desire felt by children by equating the desire for these blackberries with sexual longing you know lust is about sexual longing but we again have this deep impulsive desire being suggested by these two lexical choices sort of diction of impulsive passion that drives the children in this act of blackberry picking and red ones inked up, and that hunger sent us out. So hunger itself is personified here, with a fairly commanding tone, giving it agency over these children, which emphasise the intensity of their desire in this action, that they want to catch hold of these blackberries with deep, intense, impulsive pleasure. And then that's developed through this listing. They sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, which gives us this frantic sense of urgency that these kids are willing to use any of these devices to try and get hold of as many of these fruits as possible and perhaps also the haphazard improvised nature of what they're doing you know will play into that um sense of urgency it sent us out where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots so again in these images where briars are scratching the children and the wet grass is bleaching their boots. Nature's personified, actually actively impeding their progress, as if it's trying to prevent the children from violating it in some way by taking its fruit. And I think it also goes to sort of foreground their intense desire to overcome these obstacles, that they're not going to be put off by this um, sort of defensive interaction of, of nature with them. The briars bleached and boots in those uh, words in this line give us that plosive alliteration that I think gives you a sense of the heavy struggle that the children are willing to overcome in their effort to get hold of these fruits, such as the intensity of their lust and hunger for them. They're round hayfields, cornfields and potato drills, and there's a sort of mirroring here of that... Um, milk cans, pea tins and jam pots. This listing of these locations gives you the sense of the great lengths that they're willing to go to in order to pick these fruits. These are all very different versions of fields and, and 
gives you a, a panoramic view of the setting, I think, of this lifestyle from which Heaney feels alienated as a child, you know, as, as feeling like he's outgrown it in some way. And that perhaps this is the sort of apotheosis of the pleasures that this lifestyle will yield to him. We trekked and picked until the cans were full. And the word trekking, I mean, that deliberate verbal choice there, I think has a connotation of discovery. You know, you trek if you're, you, you're go, undergoing a journey of quite serious proportions, usually into unknown territory, like the unknown territory of the, equa the, the, the experience of pleasure. It also suggests the sort of extreme distances that this hiking around the farmyards and agricultural settings of Northern Ireland seem to um, give the children the impression that they're moving across vast distances to carry to collect all these ripe blackberries early on in the season. We trekked and picked until the cans were full. That K sound in the alliteration, I think, recreates this percussive noise of the fruit being dropped into these metallic containers. The king picked cans, you know, the, there's a, a sort of a sense of their... Um, abundance i think in that noise that they're sort of cashing in on all this fruit that is all over the place and filling their containers and repositories full of all these different fruits until the cans were full until the tinkling bottom had been covered and again that sound of that k alliterative sound is tinkling and covered from the previous lines trekked picked cans is continued there in that onomatopoeic adjective tinkling bottom making it sound as if the bottom of the can is is making noise like a musical instrument and it chimes with this percussive alliteration in the previous line to complete this audible image until they'd been covered with green ones so if you think here you've got this sort of protective treatment of un of the ripe fruit by the unripe ones and they're being handled, you know, the layer at the bottom of the, of, the, of the containers is being filled with unripe green berries so that the, the dark, ripe fruit doesn't burst. And, of course, this is the anticlimactic, tragic sort of ending of this poem is that all this, this fruit does go ripe, uh, sort of overripe and, and begins to ferment. But on top of that, that protective layer of green, unripe fruits are big, dark blobs burned. So again, the plosives are emphasised in this line that associates the sort of heavy ripe fruit with, I think, this the sense of excessive pleasure with which they're exploding. There's a kind of infantile vocabulary in here that I think captures a sense of excess and excitement at the picking of these fruit. They burned like a plate of eyes, and so there's this really surprising simile that gives us both the impression of the sense of violation and surprise as if <gasps> something horrifying has happened to nature itself and perhaps the hostile judgment that Heaney fears and reveals his guilt at feelings of disillusionment with this agricultural lifestyle and the sort of violation and transgression that's involved in that feeling of disillusion. As our hands were peppered with thorn pricks. So you have this synesthetic image here of taste and touch as if the hands are being almost seasoned by the thorn pricks, but also peppered by the spikiness of those thorn pricks and tactile imagery. Captures, I think, a sense of, of humans sort of being seasoned like food by a kind of hostile natural world that's reacting to the human transgression and violation of its boundaries and then our palms are sticky as bluebeards this is an allusion to Charles Perrault's court de Mamere about a nobleman that murders his own wife and so there's this in this simile is a suggestion I think of of some sort of murderous transgressive sensuality that feeds into Heaney's ideas of, about guilt and alienation as if he's done something deeply immoral by feeling alienated from this lifestyle that this act of blackberry picking embodies. 
but again a sense of transgression and and the loss of innocence is I think captured through that illusion. We hoarded the fresh berries in the buyer. So hoarding, you know, it comes back to a, a individual word that's used in the barn, giving this sense of of careful treatment and value of something that's produced by nature, as if it's treasure. You know, you usually have a treasure hoard, and they're hoarded in the buyer, which is a cow shed. So we've got this taking of these berries from their natural environment and moving them inside a man-made construction that connotes this sense of taint and destruction that the poem narrates. But then it says, when the bath was filled, we found a fur. And it creates this aural connection between the words, a sort of a connection on the level of sound, an audible connection between all these words that describe the rapid disintegration of the berries, filled, found, and fur, that suddenly we fill it up, we discover it's rotting, and then there's a fur on the top of it. So we have this very rapid sense of transition and transience from this moment of hoarding in the line before. You know, at this point, there is this peak sense of value, as if the berries themselves are a type of treasure. And then in the line following, the sudden degeneration of that, natural treasure into a kind of tainted sense of filth the bath was filled we found a fur of a rat gray fungus glutting on our cash so this fungus again continues that f alliteration and that rat gray fungus that imagery i think that comes back to actually some of the imagery in the barn um and captures that sudden transition from beauty and nature to disintegration and degeneration that this rat gray fungus this predatory kind of vermin is glutting on their cash on our cash so the the mold is personified gives it giving it this sense of sinner, sinister intent and disgust it's quite palpable in that verbal choice and the cachet shows that the hoarding was ineffective that they didn't store it very well. And it's probably no coincidence that this happens in a, in a buyer, a cow shed, which is probably full of bacteria that would precipitate this degeneration. The juice was stinking too. So we have this choice of quite vague language there, of just imprecise disgust. It's just juice and stinking which is in direct contrast, I think, to the sensual pleasure and, and sort of fine discrimination and delectation of the thickened wine and summer's blood in that initial phase of excitement. So this is just generic sense of the juice stinking loosely and disgustingly. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented and the sweet flesh would turn sour. So we've got that alliteration again of fruit fermenting and flesh and fair and felt like crying, coming from that filled and found a fur. So we've got this continuation of that process of degeneration being alluded to through that alliterative treatment of that F sound, the suddenness of degeneration, pairing up these words that are associated with the beginning of the poem, fruit and flesh, with the degeneration, fermenting. And then the consequences emotionally felt like crying it wasn't fair. So within that F sound is the sort of narrative of, of excitement, degeneration, and then a sense of injustice across all of those words in that verbal pattern across those lines. The antithetical structure of the sweet flesh would turn sour. Sweetness and sour alongside each other gives you, again, that sense of rapid disintegration as if pleasure itself has been conjured up in front of the eyes of the speaker and then very cruelly whipped away from him. And then that's where you get this petulant childlike tone in the next lines, in these short sentences. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair. As if this experience keeps happening. And actually, as a child, that sense of injustice is something that hasn't been learned from. But actually, at this moment, that the poem narrates of transition of maturity and development, there's something different about this experience that is different from the annual sense of injustice 
uh, the blackberries fermenting, creating this child. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canful smelt of rot. So we've got this juxtaposition here of lovely canfuls and smelling of rot, emphasizing the rapidity of their disintegration and the degeneration that the plant captures. And the full rhyme of clot and knot Re, of rot and knot re-echoes clot and knot from the first poem that narrates the poem's plot about the ephemerality of pleasure that we've got that couplet that echoes the opening where we've got the clot and knot of tightly bound sensual pleasure and then rot and knot now and it's a different kind of knot it's, it's, you know, it's a negative knot not a tightly bound physical knot with a K so that transformation is being given to us in that echoing of a rhyming couplet from the beginning in a circularity in the poem's structure. Each year I hoped they'd keep, but knew they would not. And the antithesis again here brings together that childish desire for these treasures to be sort of preserved, but then the mature skepticism that understands the transient nature of all pleasures, knowing that they won't keep. 